guys how are you doing we are all here in Jami Masjid as you can see trying to set up for the 50th anniversary for tomorrow 50th anniversary of the Masjid Alhamdulillah one of the first masjids to be built this is the scene over here I'll walk out of the picture so you guys can see Alhamdulillah we're all set up those of you who hear this please come tomorrow at uh, 1 o'clock uh, you will actually hear when our Tam Sarah has been doing some machines. So this is not in the plan, but we did say that we will change the plan. So this is the first thing that we are changing, inshallah. So in about five minutes, we will be doing some machines. So please have a seat, have your kids sitting here. They would love his machines, so they should be closer to him. As many as you can. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa
are not going anywhere. And the people who are coming here, they are still coming here. And then they are not the same people who were coming. They used to come earlier. So every five years, there is a new set of people. And we go over again and again with the same people. So we thank you to the neighbors for the invitation. And I will mention, I have a short speech. After the Zohar prayer, we will take a prayer. Please listen to it. We will have some very valuable information. No, 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 قد قامت الصلاة 
الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن وتصلح بها دينا 
I take this opportunity to share some info about Islam and Muslims in general and GTA in particular. Islam and Muslims are not new to Canada. We arrived on its shore long before Canada's birth in 1867. A young woman of Scottish descent gave birth to the first Muslim Canadian aptly named James Love, born in Ontario in the year 1854. It may also be argued that most of the Africans escaping the tyranny of the slavery from the deep south via the underground railroad seeking freedom and security in Canada might have been Muslims. The first census of Canada in 1871 listed 13 Muslims as part of its inhabitants. By 1921, that number rose to 478, in 1931 to 645, in 1981 to 98,165. And according to the 2011 census, the Muslim population numbered 1,053,945. Today, after 150 years of confederation, perhaps we number more than a million and a half and are now and are comprised of 60 distinct ethnic groups and speak over 150 languages, all the while enjoying freedom of religion, civil rights, democracy and the friendship of our neighbors. The first recorded independent structure constructed and used as a mosque was in the city of Edmonton, Alberta in the year 1938 by settlers from Lebanon. Eventually it fell into disuse, put on wheels and moved to be preserved as a historical building. From that humble beginning, the Muslims spread their wings across the great expanse of Canada, from Atlantic to the Pacific and from Great Lakes to the Arctic. The landscape is dotted with mosques both big and small, functional and beautiful. Close to half a million Muslims or more call the GTA home. The history of Muslims in these parts cannot be shared without giving the due credit to Jami Mosque and its founders. European Muslims from the Balkan region, mainly Albanians. In 1964, a storefront on Dandas Street, the forerunner to Jami Mosque was bought and converted into a Muslim. In 1969, it was sold to buy a larger church on Boosted Avenue in the upscale neighborhood of High Park, which is where we are now. During the early years, there was a conflict between the founders and the newcomers. Bearing that tumultuous period, the Jami became a home away from home without prejudice for a vast majority of Muslims coming from all corners of the world. Jami Mosque was a pioneer in starting new programs in Toronto, an Islamic school, funeral service, the Islamic Housing Corporation, just to name a few from a long list. In 1972, we could hardly fill one row during Friday prayers. By the early 90s, every nook and corner of the mosque would be filled and would often spill into the parking lot. In the late 90s, the wind shifted and the new arrivals settled in, the, settled in the suburbs together with the older generation. A number of mosques opened up all over the GTA and beyond. Most of these sprouted from Jami. For that reason, it is fondly called Mother of All Mosque in GTA. Current estimates suggest over 200 mosques plus umpteen musallas. Jami Mosque is 50 year old and resides in a 100 year old building. At this stage, it may be appropriate to call it the grandmother of all mosques in the GTA. Finally, words cannot express the gratitude we feel towards our neighbors in the aftermath of 9-11 when public and media attention was focused on Jami and when the tragedies at the mosque in Quebec City and the New Zealand unfolded. You, dear neighbors, graciously stood by us and provided the much needed support and comfort. On behalf of Isna Canada and the congregation of Jami Mas, I thank you from the bottom of my heart and I hope that our next 50 years together 
will be as useful and fruitful. God bless you. Reminds me of something which I heard a long time ago. As you get older, don't slow down. There's not much time left. The guy, every, the person that I'm going to introduce next, every time I see him, I see more energy in him. Uh, he is a model for me. He is a teacher, be it as a father, as a grandfather, as a counselor, as an imam, as a khatib, or as the first school administrator and teacher right here at Jami almost 30 years ago. You go to the World Wide, World Wide Web, now called the internet or whatever you want to call it, you will find everything about him. So I'm not going to tell you about all the details that he has. Again, this is not working. He is, just like Brother Amjad is the face of Jame, he is the face of Islam, and also most of the Masajids, most of the Shayukhs know him, and actually he has taught them all of them. No one else but our own Sheikh Abdullah Idrisa. country and this Islam and this masjid and the people who come here. In another way, this is a very Canadian mosque because like Canada's demography keeps changing, the demography of this mosque has constantly been evolving. Originally Albanian, then Arabs, then Indians and Pakistanis, then primarily Somalis, and now, totally multicultural. In the very difficult post-9-11 period, when we used to come for our Friday prayers from downtown, I used to bring my colleagues from work and some friends, Canadian friends, to make them sit at the back. I said, look at this audience. This is a virtual United Nations. And this virtual United Nations is very Islamic and it's very Canadian. So this is a great blessing, as Dr. Mehdi said, that this multicultural uh, religious grouping from around the world, which is Islam, has found a great home in this great multicultural country called Canada. 
So we say dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that for the next 50 years this masjid continues and grows and continues to have the patience and understanding of all the neighbors. Thank you very much. Over 30 years um, ago, when I was in my uh, early teens, is when you know I was part of a, the community here, mashallah. And um, the memories that I that I have have really uh, made the foundation um, of my Islam. Just being a uh, Muslim in Canada and a Muslim in Toronto, and. Uh, just from the, the things that my parents um, started, like the, the, the girl circle and the boy scouts, um, and when the girl guys didn't want the uh, Muslims to be a part of it because of their clothing, they started the girl circle. And um, the youth groups and really laid the foundation for young people um, and Muslims in Toronto. And I'm, I'm looking out here and I see a lot of familiar faces that, you know, the people that I grew up with and um, the sisters who helped tirelessly in this mosque. And really, it, it really is um, the women who really uh, worked so hard to develop so many programs in this mosque and are, you know, the basis and um, the foundation for all of us. Uh, I'm talking to myself, a young person, but young people. And, and the seeds that they planted have now uh, gone on to my children and uh, their children. So, um, and I know my, my father was uh, speaking and said that it was of course, right? So, um, just basically on behalf of my father who left my parents and um, sent his uh, warm salat to everyone from the warm country that he's in. Um, and, uh, yes. But contribute the development of the Muslim community in Canada. Go ahead, Dr. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala ashwab wa salim 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 I came to Toronto in 1976, September and I lived in an apartment at King and Jensen for one year and I choose that location because I said it will be close to Jana Mosque and it goes to my work in downtown Toronto. But after one year, I moved to Dornell, and after the year, I moved to Moody first to Vail, and again, I moved to the Sunday Sun School at Sherway. The reason I'm saying this is because we used to have, I was in the administration of work in Toronto, they excuse me or selected me, whatever you can call, to be in the administration, but, uh, but, uh, I, I, we are missing actually a few people from the administration at that time who are very dear to my heart. We are missing Dr. Jannah, who was very sick, he could, he could not join us, and he did contribute a lot to this mosque. We are missing also Brother Abdel Nanam Abdel Faddah, who was very sick, he cannot come today, and also he did contribute a lot to this mosque. We are missing Brother Mazhar al he passed away. He also did contribute quite a bit to this mosque. We have our brother Sayyid al Hassan uh, with, with us here, and he also uh, contributed a lot. And as far as I remember, we have brother Murad, and we have brother Kurdi. Uh, uh, but anyhow, uh, and uh, besides being in the administration, uh, they asked me to do the program of Sunday. It was what we used to do every Sunday after Zohar. We used to invite speaker who would speak to the audience, the audience, and this was the program. So I used to drive myself and my family every Sunday here to Jamia Mosque uh, to attend uh, Zohar prayer. This was Sunday. And then I introduced the speaker and uh, some of them are here. Uh, we used to get brother uh, Abdul Hayy uh, 
Isham Badra and me to operate this masjid, to conduct khutbahs and lead prayers and offer rollings and dars. Isham Badran was trained in Arabic language and I was trained in Usul of Deen and Sharia. So he would delegate me the responsibility of offering advice in matters of fiqh and teach hadith and fiqh and deliver most of the khutbahs. I stood here on the member here when I was 25 and I was a very timid person. I used to shake and tremble and oftentimes I would pray in winter. May there be a big snow, snowstorm so that I don't have to be Utba tomorrow. <laughs> but of course I learned the hard way. I would stand up to lead prayer without hat. And somebody will come and rush, put a hat on me. I will put it back, put it again three times. And finally I realized I must take this hat. <laughs> because they told me if you put this hat, they would be willing to listen to my advice. So I researched and I got the wisdom from him. I will return me and shower you and others. Oftentimes you have to compromise your fiqh and go for the less important priority so that there is no tashmish. Remember I learned that we need to change our application of Islam right here. I have so many examples, I will share some of them with you. I was standing here on the member once, a brother comes, stands, positions himself right in front of me. In the course of my kutubah, he decides to take off his pants. I became speechless, I thought he is going to strip himself down completely. Then I realized, Alhamdulillah, I have to say Alhamdulillah in my heart, because he had pyjama. Because he comes from a culture that you are not supposed to lead prayer wearing pants. So I had to change this kind of understanding one by one. I still remember I was teaching Mikir at two high school students came with the teachers. Some of them were women. And in the course of my lecture to them and answering questions, one brother came to me, Imam Sahib, I have an urgent question to you. I will only take one minute. So I went to him, I stood him myself to the crowd. He said, what is it? Imam Sahib, did you make sure that these ladies are not menstruating? I said to them, I said to the brother, it's none of my business. Later on I explained to him, Prophet was on grammar raised this question to be men. He even made a tent for one woman to stay in the masjid. Okay, anyway, this, in the process of acting as an imam, I had also to learn at that time how to mop the floor, how to sweep, because there was budget was very limited for the masjid. I came from a landowning family in India. We had three servants inside the home and a half a dozen outside. So I never knew how to mop the floor, so I would stick, put the stick right straight and Hisham Badran would come and teach me how to you know, sweep the floor. And he gave me some lessons and both of us were cleaning the masjid, shoveling the snow. And by the way, he was a very hospitable man, an Arab. I enjoyed his makruba. Up till now I enjoyed makruba and I learned how to cook it. And one of the Sundays I cooked it for my family. This was another learning process. And I have a lot of stories to relate to you. Dr. Marini said only he did not finish that. Because I had to leave this masjid because I thought inviting non-Muslims into this place, they prefer to come here in large numbers actually. Oftentimes in a month we would have four or five groups. And the administration said, Innamal Mushrikuna Najasun. The Mushriks are Najas, they are not supposed to be in the masjid. I had to argue with them, debate with them. Finally, I resigned from a masjid. 
And then I was Imam in the Islamic Foundation of Toronto for 10 years with one sister of who had embraced Islam. After she had embraced Islam, she listened to the khutbah. After the Duma, I asked her, what's your impression of our sermon? She said, I am not used to hearing voices without looking at the speaker. At that time, I said to myself, Astaghfirullah, we have distorted this religion. There was no barrier in the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then, at that moment, I decided, if you are going to have another place, we will make sure that men and women will occupy the same floor without any partition. And I got a question for the fatwa about Islam. All Islam not at that time. Imam Kuti, why are you removing the partition from the masjid? Is it that you want to look at women while delivering the khutbah? I said, no brother, this was the way the Prophet organized his masjid. I cannot blame my masjid is better than that. And actually, I have grown up in Jami Mosque. And from there, I have moved after my study in McGill University. Now I realize it is time for Muslims to change our narrative, the application and interpretation of fiqh. And all of our ulama need to rethink the fiqh legacy because they are totally, totally irrelevant as they are applied in the Muslim countries. If you want to move forward, we need to empower our women. I just finished by narrating to you a sad story. I was invited to one of the most traditional masjids, I don't want to name it, to settle a divorce dispute. There were four imams, three of them dropped their wives in the shopping malls. And I had my wife, I wanted to challenge the authorities of the masjid. I want to uh, force them to take my wife. And actually, when they saw me with my wife, they could not refuse to agree to her. But, and she was taken to a dark room. No light, no fan, and she had to pray three salah there by all by herself in the masjid. So this made me more determined that it is time for us to open up our masjid to women and empower them. They have to be in the forefront. So every classroom that we have in the Islamic Institute, women share equal space. And actually this kind of understanding of Islam made my son an articulate spokesman for Islam. And my daughter Sajid Alhamdulillah has written so many books removing, you know, the misgivings about Islam and presenting it in a better way so that people can relate to her, to the, to the, uh, uh, the way we, uh, we, we should be narrating uh, the story of Islam. I have a lot of stories to share with you, I know. I want to give, there will be other questions, so I am going to develop on that, Isha. Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Takbir! Allahu Akbar! So, Sheikh Pati, I just have a question, and you just five second answer. Where's that cap now? Where's that cap which you used to wear? Well, I have the cap now here. Can we auction it? Well, you know, many times I go to shopping centers, and when the people saw me, they look at me, are you Sheikh Puti? I said, yes, I am Sheikh Puti, but I am wearing, you know, pants and shirt. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> I think the question cannot be answered in few minutes because community has evolved, developed through this masjid. So that is the shortest answer I can give because when I came here to this country, that time Muslim community was, some number of them were not so much mindful of Islam. They were, uh, so only those who we're looking to preserve their iman, look, we're looking for money. People have come, have come from many parts of the world, but there were some who were serious about Islam. They came to, and this was the only masjid in that time. In fact, I can hardly see any woman wearing hijab in those days. Anyone with a beard, even I think I was the only one that had a beard when I came. So, it, it, that atmosphere was completely different. And, and that time, 
having a masjid here, which opened in this masjid opened in 69 September, I can well recall that the month I came here. But I was a more of, when I came here, I was first introduced to Islamic Foundation, which was again an offshoot of this masjid. They broke away from this uh, congregation and they were praying at the uh, St. Mary School on Bakers and Adelaide. So my host introduced me there and I started with Associated for Islamic Foundation for a number of years. And it was only after a reacquisition of this, that is another story which I have written, uh, the history of Jamil Mars, which was on the website for a number of years. But anyone interested can have me, it would take me another hour to tell you the story of uh, how it was reacquired in uh, 1973 at that time. But uh, some of the pioneers are sitting here, so I'm really happy to see. So I never thought myself that I would be sitting here celebrating 50 years uh, in this country, or 50 years in this masjid. And may Allah preserve this masjid and accept the contribution of each and every one, but it has helped develop the community, nurtured Iman among children from those who are knowledgeable and relevant in Islam, as well as refreshing atmosphere for many adults at that time. I also like your caption. I think I am sitting with four who are really son of in this the regard of this masjid. So I am the khanam of them. <laughs> so may Allah subhanahu wa make us the khairul khanam, the khairul salam. Really I will talk about this uh, first point in three areas I want to cover it. First thing is that that I remember one time Umar anhu was sitting in front of Kaaba and he was sitting with some other Sahaba and he said, can you dream, can you have a wish now, have a wish. So every Sahabi was saying, suppose if I go for jihad, other words say, if I have a money, I donate, if I have so and so. Umar was totally different in his, in his wish. And he said, if I have a wish, I want to see people like this, this, this Sahabi's name, in naming them. He said, if I have in front of these Sahaba, I use him for the service of Islam. So you can imagine that we are sitting here, we can have a wish that Sheikh Kurti was talking about the heat he took. First generation of our generation, they took it, right? I came later, so I didn't took this heat. But really, for me, this is a continuity of our past to future and to future. And how we make ourselves connected with our past, and how we develop our present and to make our future better, and how we make a continuity. So this is the first thing. If I have a wish, I can say, Alhamdulillah, we have people. So the makan is very important, but the makin, those who are really connected to this, are more important. The second point is that, you know, Brother Harun Sahib and Shabdir the Kuljamaat, you know, they were talking about the issue that we supposed to form an Ummah and we came here as an Ummah, right? Really, in my observation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided us two time to form us as an Ummah. One time when the, you know, in Gulf countries, there was a flow of money and they were hiding from everywhere. So the the Muslims, they were coming from all over the world, maybe hundred and further countries. They were in position to form an Ummah there. But that country is still living with tribal feeling. They think either you are with me as a tribal person or you are out of tribal. There's no, nothing third. Allah subhanahu wa opened the world, Western world for Muslims. And we are here coming from hundred plus countries. And we have the opportunity to form us as Ummah. But Ummah not means just we name it. The Ummah means that how we be supposed to stick with our minor issues. But in the fundamental issues, we go with Islam as our target. And Ummah, all people from all over the world as one. And Masjid is supposed to be center point of this Ummah. Hilal. 
you know one of the story my son who is a lawyer told me that an entrepreneur from you know china you they were on a dinner and this man told him he shocked at the muslim but you know rich people businessman from canada going to china and asking him to make duplicate things and of course he took them for dinner and they asked him is this chicken halal so he was startled and he asked them is your business halal they had no answer my involvement in the muslim community since 1972 convince me this is at the root of the muslim problem here we give so much importance to frivolous issue of halal meat so much so that the entire term halal is associated with halal meat but halal income halal ethics in business is not part of sharia actually the way sharia is interpreted today it's really shocking i was on islam online live fatwa a person from bangalore is asking the question a lady has been raped by the friend of the colleague at work and the man is thrown in jail and the masjid decided to get the man out of jail by suggesting that this man give his daughter to the rapist and the question posed to me is, is this your sharia i said to myself no it is not my sharia because you know what if somebody want to propose to marry a woman and she refuses the message you are giving him is go and rape her and she will be awarded come to you as a gift this is the kind of approach to sharia i am not saying every one of us is doing that but this is the standard way sharia is understood and implemented in this part among many communities because they confuse sharia with legalism and it is high time that we bring back the spirit of isa alayhi salam as imam shah ali ullah said the sharia of islam has the way of jesus as well as the law of moses and it is time now to stress the soul of the islamic law and our ulama have to take up this challenge and expose this myth the way the sharia is distorted and that should come from the masjids he will talk about the experience that he had how he grew up in jami he is approximately i think I want to say Brock. At least 14 to 15 years old. Alhamdulillah. Please welcome Brother Ibrahim. And please be seated.
connect our hearts and physically and mentally to keep going to this mosque. Not only this mosque, but other mosques, because all of them have salah. And I want to thank all the teachers and the staff members here who uh, uh, organized this uh, celebration. And Jazakumullah khair. <laughs> mother is in the audience. Sister Lahiba must be a very, very proud mother. Can she just stand up? Jazakumullah khair and for raising such a great But the first Eid Salat was at CNE, started here from Jannah Mosque in 1974, if I recall correctly. And the youth played a major part in uh, organizing that. One of the things that not, not, has not seen in any masajids to this day is a shoe check, just like we have court check uh, racks. So the young people who are there volunteering and taking shoes and putting a tag in it so when you come back you can find your shoes. That continued for a couple of years, and then as the crowd got bigger, it became a kind of a problem, management problem. So it stopped. But this is something that in our masajids, where we need to have this implemented. If volunteers, even not Muslim, can be hired for the shoes, because people have lost shoes. One of the famous story of shoe loss is, if you remember, late Jack Layton, in his riding in Danforth's uh, Medina Masjid, he used to go regularly, and on each day he went with a brand new shoe that cost about, I think, over $1,000. And somebody went to it out with his new shoes. <laughs> yeah, and also the Consul, former, uh, Consul General of Pakistan, late uh, Tariq, I believe, he became High Commissioner in Ottawa afterwards, uh, and got killed in an accident in Ottawa. But he started Juma prayer at the uh, North York Library. Now his, I give a khutbah that day when it was his last day. And he, and last day he was to leave for the flight in the evening and somebody swapped his new shoes with the old one. <laughs> so many have lost shoes in the masjid, but uh, one funniest moment I think I missed the question is that when I first came here in 1970, I came here in 69 as a student of engineering and uh, because there was a conflict going on over here, the masjid was closed at times, so I didn't come here till about Good Friday, I believe, for, for my first Juma. And I met here the, the first one as I entered the Vice President, Lady Ibayu Bali, and uh, uh, Rasul, Lady Rasulullah Korali, whose son, Hussein Akorali, is here, and I happened to witness the first wedding here in Canada in 1971, who got married here by late Rajab Asim, the Imam, first Imam of Toronto, I would say, uh, in that time, and also Dr. Omar Ali. So, Brother Ayu Bali, I knew his brothers, he asked me, he said, Can you give khutbah? I said, No, I'm here for the first time. I would respectfully decline. Then the Imam, who was an official Imam here, the Doctor Professor Bay, he didn't come. So there were group, two groups here fighting with each other. Uh, they were opposed to each other. Some of you may recall that conflict. So they said, "Where is the Imam?" They start shouting, screaming, and there was. I said, "This is now going to get into the blows. A fist fight. I will see in the masjid." I asked myself, "Where am I? What? I never seen this happen in any masjid in my life." So the Brother Ali and Rasul probably both came and said, can you give khutbah, otherwise this will get worse. So I gave them my first khutbah here in 1970, and then after a number of times I gave khutbahs here as well. So this is one of the funniest stories I can recall. Another story was uh, Jamaat al Tabligh work also started here. This was the Marcus. That first gym, at that, that he stayed here with the late Colonel no, Amiruddin. And some, uh, every, the month, they, every week they used to have an istima here. On weekend they would come and sleep. So some of brothers, one day were sleeping. This is uh, after the your time, when Hisham Bazar was here. And Zuhar time came, they were still sleeping. So Hisham, Brother Hisham Bazar, gave a dan. After Hayal al Fulai said, As salatu khayrun minan nam. <laughs> <laughs> we were sleeping, he tried to wake up. <laughs> Everybody said, I'm in job. Hey, this is Zohar Azhar, not Fajr Azhar. So you guys are sleeping, so to wake you up. <laughs> is everyone awake now? Because he can stay till Fajr. Jazakumullah Khairan. Actually, you mentioned uh, Hussain Akbar Ali's name as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He is here. Right here. Yes, he is here as well. So I will actually uh, request uh, Sheikh Hamdi and Sheikh Abdullah. Please come on the stage.
He's going to present something to us, and you just stay here, James, so we will make, take this opportunity for that presentation. And you also mentioned the financial, uh, other stuff. The so financial services, as Dr. Ashraf has mentioned, also started here. So there is a lot of things which have happened which we may have missed. So Brother Zana Kareli is going to unwrap this. He is, this is the thing that he wants to be passive. You have to promise me how long you will serve. Two minutes, I take the mic away. Just like Allah, Salaam Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. I am deeply honored to be among all these scholars who are over here. I came in 1969 where life was very, very difficult at the Jami, just purchased masjid. Dad was here, as the Imam Abdul Haq Patel mentioned. And when you look on, on the carpet over here, there was no vacuum cleaner. Dad used to go and pick it up, mom and my sisters cleaning the washroom and cleaning the, the kitchen. And finally, with all the problem that was facing in Jami, the mosque was closed, people bring namaz, salat uh, outside. And uh, finally, if you don't know, the mosque was for sale, and it was all, almost sold. Yes. My dad was crying at that time when we get the news that the mosque is sold almost, and we start packing the wares. Brother Karim, who has a restaurant on rubber made and blue, has so many kitchen utensils, plates, and all that. We start packing me, my wife, my sisters, and everybody. Finally, my wife, my dad was crying and he took the initiative on himself. He was the only one who went to Oakville, met somebody who speak Arabic, phoned the embassy of Ottawa, and from Ottawa went to King Faisal. And subhanAllah, King Faisal did not even think once, he sent the money the next day, the next day. And when my dad went to Hajj in 1975, he was the honor on behalf of Jan Mosque with my mom to be hosted by the kingdom. They make hats together and went to Medina and came back. And from the blessing of Jan Mosque, my dad was very, very cautious and very, very humble to continue to work with MSC, to come every Friday to open the mosque and to prepare the place for Salat al Jumma. And fortunately, 1979, during Friday for Salat al Jumma'ah, while he was running to catch the bus to come here, he got a heart attack. Eventually, he passed away in 1979. But in 1975, I will just take 30 seconds, while he was preparing with my beloved mom to go to Hajj, Hisham Badram was here home to get in Arabic and give my dad. He said, when you go over there, go to the door of the kingdom and present that letter. So my dad did. When he presented the letter over there, he went straight to King Faisal and they came at the door with the army to meet my dad and my mom. So mom stayed at the kingdom and then did Hajj in Mecca and Medina and on their way, on, on their way to come back to Canada, this is what represents the whole trip. In Mecca and Medina, Prince Faisal, if they are Aziz give this gift to my mom and my dad, the picture of the late King Faisal, who sent $75,000, my dad received the money to pay the Jami Mosque. So today we are here, over here, we are in debt to Marhum, Prince Khalid, Faisal, if they are Aziz, if his money in the mosque. So anytime when you pray, remember him, and remember all the people who fought and for the right of Muslim and fight for the right of the Jami to make it where we are today. I would like to thank you and present this gift from the Kingdom, from King Faisal family, to Sheikh, to Sheikh Abdullah and Sheikh Hamdi on behalf of the family of the Kingdom from Saudi Arabia. Brother Hussain, it was $110,000 I received the check. Well, then, Jamal Banawami, can you come together and show us in that picture, please? Please, come. Imam Kuti, please. My dad, friend. Brother Abdul Hai Patel, too. Janadri, please. Can you come and join us, all of you, please?
Sheikh Khalid Faisal.